Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. May uh, the peace and blessings of God be upon uh, all of you. Uh, thank you for having us here and hosting this bar. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm actually not going to take too much of your time. Um, I, uh, I've noticed that usually when um, there's a Muslim speaker, people have a lot of questions. Uh, so maybe I'll actually open it up for some Q&A in, in a minute or so. You can ask me whatever you want about Islam. It doesn't have to be about fasting. Uh, but fasting is one of the uh, pillars of Islam. So there's a famous hadith. Hadith is a saying of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And there's different grades of these hadith. Some are strong, some are weak, some are fabricated. Uh, this particular hadith tends to be strong, where he said, Dunya Islamu ala khams, to quote him directly, uh, Islam is built on five, right? By five he meant the pillars. So the first pillar is called the shahada, in Arabic, means witnessing. Uh, so witnessing that there's only one God, right? And Muslims call this God Allah. And Allah is not a foreign God. Um, according to the Quran, Allah is the God of Abraham. Uh, Allah is the God of Moses. Allah is the God of Jesus. And these prophets are mentioned in the text of the Quran itself, right? So Allah is not some, you know, Arab God or, you know, the God of the, the Middle Easterners or something like that. He's the God of Abraham, right? So Shahada is to witness that he is the only one God. When I say he is the only one God, that's, again, not to say that God is masculine or male, but uh, every word in Arabic is assigned a gender by the linguist. Uh, so sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's a natural gender. Sometimes the linguist will assign what's known as a lexical gender to the word. So, for example, the word the, the, the word for sun, S-U-N, in Arabic is shams, but the linguist, way back in the day, decided that the sun is feminine and the moon is masculine. Nobody really knows why that is. Maybe there's someone here that studied the history or the etymology of Arabic uh, words. Uh, but the word Allah in Arabic is masculine lexically, so we refer to him as him, that there's no God but him that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who Muslims believe to be the last uh, in a long line of prophets, starting with Adam, uh, and including names like, like we said, Abraham, even Noah, even David and Solomon are seen as prophets, uh, Elijah, um, and there is a minority opinion that there are several female prophets, including the wife of Pharaoh, named Asya, who's uh, story is not told as far as I know in Jewish sources, um, uh, as well as Sarah and Hagar and Mary, who's the mother of Jesus, uh, who's mentioned in the Quran as well. So the Shahada is similar to maybe the Shema in, in its importance, right? But this is sort of the essence of uh, Islamic confession. And then the second pillar is known as Salah, uh, which, believe it or not, has an etymology, a common etymology with Tafillah in Hebrew, which means prayer. So Muslims, uh, well, they should at least pray five times a day at different times, right? Um, and uh, you know, these prayers take a few minutes. When somebody converts to Islam, it's kind of burdensome. I have to pray again, I just prayed three hours ago. Right. But then as you age <laughs> and get wiser, these things become much easier. Uh, so they take a few minutes, every few hours. Uh, and then there's something called zakah, which is also known as sadaqa, or swadaqa in, in Hebrew, it's related to sadiq, um, which has a root meaning of to purify something. So it's, Zakah or sadaqa is a uh, a poor due. Muslims, if there's excess wealth, and this is only for people that can afford that. 
two and a half percent of their excess wealth will go to the uh, less fortunate or to the poor. And then we have the fourth pillar, which is called uh, Hajj, or Hajj in Hebrew, or if you live in Egypt, it's also called Hajj, because the, the jim and the, the letter jim in Arabic, uh, he, in the Egyptian dialect is pronounced like a female. So they'll say like, uh, Michael Gordon, instead of Michael Jordan. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, again, this is for Muslims that can afford to do so, they'll make a pilgrimage to Mecca. Once a year is the obligation, if you can afford to do so. And then there's something called the Umrah, which is the lesser pilgrimage. And then finally, the fifth pillar is called Som, which is exactly the same word in Hebrew, Som in fasting, also known as Siyam in the Quran. The Quran says, Kutiba alaykum usiyam kama kutiba ala ladina min qablikum. The Quran says to the Muslims at large that fasting is prescribed upon you just as it was prescribed upon those before you. And the exegetes here uh, clarify and say, before you means Ahlil Kitab, the people of the Bible, or the people of the book, Jews and Christians. Right. And then, so the, the purpose of fasting is given. So there's an axiom amongst the scholars of Islam that the merit of something is known by its objective. So the objective of fasting, according to the Quran, is in order for you to be people of God consciousness. The word in Arabic is taqwa, which is very, very difficult to translate. Uh, sometimes it's translated as fear of God, in order for you to fear God, uh, which is the beginning of all wisdom, according to the Bible. Sometimes it's translated as um, in order for you to uh, repel evil, to guard against evil. Right? Uh, in pre-Islamic times, the word taqwa actually meant a shield, something to block the blow of a sword. Right? So, Probably the best translation is to be conscious of God. So when Muslims are fasting, when anyone's fasting, in theory, uh, they should there should be a sort of focus on the inward, right? You're not eating, you're not drinking. There's no marital relations in the daytime, according to a Muslim's fast, in order to for one to focus on God completely. And how does one focus on God? By remembering God and by guarding one's limbs. And this is something that a Muslim is supposed to be doing all throughout the year, by the way. So Ramadan is really more like a training program to set the stage for the rest of the year. And it sort of wanes through the course of the year. It shouldn't, but it tends to. And then Ramadan, again, you enter into this training program where you're not, you're not looking at things that are forbidden. So it's not just a fast of the stomach. Right? There's a hadith of the Prophet where he said, there are several people, it's a rhetorical question, how many fasters are there that get nothing from their fast except hunger and thirst? <laughs> Meaning that they're missing the point of the fast. The point of the fast is to really master the self. Right? To master the self. There's a hadith of the Prophet, and there is some weakness of this hadith. Uh, but generally, the, the scholars of Islam will quote it uh, because they would say, they would argue that the meaning of the hadith is true, even though its chain of transmission may have some weakness. Anyway, it's reported that the Prophet said, Man arif man arafa nafsa arafa rabba. Uh, the translation is, whoever knows himself knows his Lord. Right? So the word in Arabic here, arafa or ma'rifa, really means to recognize, recognition. Whoever recognizes himself will, will recognize his Lord. So one of the meanings here, according to the scholars of this hadith, is that if you recognize your origin as God's creation, as God's beloved creation, you will come to know that God is the beloved. Another shade of meaning of this tradition is that if you master yourself, then you'll come to know God. If you can guard your eyes, guard your ears, 
You know, if you can guard your tongue from lying and from, you know, speaking ill of people behind their backs, uh, from cursing, from even raising your voice. So we have, you know, descriptions of the Prophet Muhammad as far as his disposition goes. And all of the hadiths say that the Prophet did not even raise his voice, that he was an uh, easygoing personality, right? Um, that he said, the best of you are those who are best to their family members. He said that he is not from us who doesn't honor the elderly and have mercy on our young, right? He said, none of you will enter paradise until you truly believe, and none of you will truly believe until you love one another. And then he said, shall I tell you of something that will increase your love? And they said, yes. And he said, spread peace amongst yourselves. Right. So uh, this is the main sort of focus or point of the fast is to really um, transcend the physical and also to empathize right, with those who are less fortunate. Right? to experience something of what they're experiencing for the sake of increasing our concern for them. Because the more empathy one has, the more compassion one has. And the more compassion one has, the more godlike, as it were, or more angelic they are. Right? Jesus is actually quoted in the Quran as saying, which is obviously in Arabic. But he said, be lordly. Be like God, right? You know, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, in the language of Matthew. What does it mean to be like God? It means to appropriate, if you will, divine qualities at a human level. None of us can be God, right? Uh, despite what some world leaders think, um, <laughs> or perceive themselves, we're not gonna name drop. But to be divine, with a lowercase d, is to uh, assimilate qualities of God, such as mercy and compassion, right? And this is accomplished through these pillars of Islam, through prayer, through charity, through pilgrimage, and especially through fasting. The Prophet said in a hadith, quoting God, he said, all of the actions of the sons and daughters of Adam are for him, except fasting, for indeed that is mine. And the exigents, they say, what this means is, no one knows that you're fasting. When you pray, people can see you pray. When you go to pilgrimage, people can see you in your garb and you're making your circumambulations and so on and so forth. When you're giving charity, people can see that. When you're fasting, no one knows except God. So the prophet said, God says, uh, fasting is for me and I will reward him for that um, up to uh, ad, ad infinitum. Right. So fa fasting has a very uh, uh, honored place amongst the practices of a Muslim. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> if there's time for a, a few questions, I can. If not, I'll just go sit down. What do you think? Why don't we let the other two speak oh. and then we can have questions? Sure. Yeah. That's all. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you. We will have time for questions of all three of our speakers um, at the end of the next one I would like to introduce is uh, Rabbi Larry Elder. He is of the Reformed Jewish tradition and the leader of Congregation Beth Emmet in Pleasanton. You know, it's funny because my congregation doesn't clap when I get up to speak. <laughs> Let me begin by offering greetings from the Jewish community to our Muslim friends during their holy month of Ramadan. Shalom Aleichem, Assalamu Alaikum, peace to you. Thank you to Father Logan for bringing all of us together for this interfaith iftar. Father Logan asked us to speak about fasting and hospitality in the three Abrahamic faiths, and so I'm going to turn my attention to the theme of hospitality and some of my favorite stories about Abraham. The book of Genesis says, 
that Abraham was sitting at the entrance of his tent at the hottest time of day. It says, He's there at the entrance of his tent when he sees three men approaching who turn out to be angels, only he doesn't know them. Now the rabbis ask a question. If the rabbis read the text of Genesis, they ask this question, why would Abraham be sitting out there at, at, in the doorway of his tent during the hottest time of day? It's actually cooler inside the tent in the shade, which is where one would more likely hang out when it's July in Livermore. <laughs> ah, say the rabbis. It is to prove that Abraham was actively looking for wayfarers so that he could invite them in and take care of them in the heat of the day. All right, so Abraham's a good guy, right? He's a friendly host. But the rabbis go further. You see, the text in Genesis actually begins like this. The Eternal One appeared to Abraham as he was sitting at the entrance of the tent at the hottest time of day. Looking up, Abraham saw, lo, three men standing opposite him. Seeing them, he ran from the entrance of the tent to meet them. Now, that is actually a rather contradictory storyline. Is it God who appears to Abraham, or three men, that is, angels? And the rabbis reconcile the contradiction by saying that it was both. First, God appears to Abraham, but when the three guests show up, he excuses himself from his conversation with God and runs out to greet the guests to invite them inside. The Talmud concludes with the following observation. Greater than the reception of God is the practice of hospitality. Now that's a remarkable statement on the part of the rabbis. But they're actually articulating a theology of relationship as a way of encountering God. The philosopher Franz Rosenzweig offered this explanation. The story opens by saying that God appeared to Abraham, but when Abraham applies that vision to his own world, he sees three men standing before him. This is the height of religious awareness, to see God in the human condition. Back to our three angels, or men, whatever. The text says that Abraham went out to the herd to get something to serve to his guests. It says, He took a young calf, tender and good, to prepare a meal. The medieval commentator Rashi asks why the text bothers to add the adjectives tender and good. Obviously, Abraham wouldn't serve an old, tough cut of meat to his guests. Three words are being used, young calf, which is one word, tender and good, when one word would suffice. What's the point of the superfluous language? Now, Rashi, this commentator, was a vintner by profession, and he lived in Provence, so he knew something about good food. He hypothesizes that Abraham was, wasn't simply serving veal to his guests. Indeed, a single calf alone would have been an abundance of food for three guests. No, his generosity was such that he slaughtered not one, but three calves, young, tender, and good. <laughs> each indicating a separate animal. It must have been three calves, because otherwise he wouldn't need three words. Why three when one would do so that he could serve each guest his own delicacy, which Rashi says was tongue. <laughs> Depending on your taste, that may or may not be a delicacy. <laughs> now Rashi being a true connoisseur, 
is not content to leave it there and adds an extra culinary comment. Abraham, he says, serves tongue with mustard. <laughs> I don't know how he knew that, but he says it's obvious he must have served it with mustard. Being French, I presume he thought it was Dijon or Great Pot or something like that. I think this is a delightful commentary. Every generation of rabbis seems to want to expand the description of Abraham's hospitality. Now, I haven't touched on fasting. We do that too, though I stand in awe of the spiritual discipline and the observance of Ramadan, which goes far beyond the Jewish tradition of fasting on Yom Kippur and a few minor holidays. But all of our traditions, all of us, share an ethical impulse. The test of religion is its application to the reality of life. We may think we are devoted to God, but unless we are devoted to one another, we cannot come close to God. I thank St. Bartholomew's Church for being our tent of Abraham tonight and enabling us to find God by meeting one another. It's a pleasure to introduce our third and final speaker, who is the Reverend Mark Stanger. He is a canon at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, also a clergy of the Episcopal Church, also a good friend. Um, and he has spent many years as a missioner to Jerusalem and the Holy Land, and he has guided many pilgrimages there. So I thought he would be an appropriate speaker from the Christian tradition. Thank you. I've never been a good student, so I missed the assignment about oh, fasting and hospitality. I want to talk about um, living together with our differences. His disciple John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, do not stop, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. With these words, the first followers of Jesus show something of our common human tendency for suspicion and exclusion of deciding who's in, who's out who's worthy, who's unworthy. Their words were directed against a different group doing the same healing work they were committed to doing. They had different competing truth claims. And I have a pretty bad Christian joke, so bear with me. Um, this is the way it appears somewhere on the internet. I heard it slightly differently. And the guy says, I was walking across a bridge one day, and I saw a man standing at the edge who was ready to jump. I ran over and said, stop, don't do it. Why shouldn't I, he said. Well, there's so much to live for. Like what? Are you religious? He said, yes. Me too. I, are you Christian or non-Christian? I'm Christian. So am I. Are you Catholic or Protestant? I'm a Protestant. Me too. Are you Episcopalian or Baptist? <laughs> I'm Baptist. Wow, me too. Are, are you Baptist Church of God or Baptist Church of the Lord? <laughs> Baptist Church of God. Me too. Are you original Baptist Church of God, or are you reformed Baptist Church of God? Reformed Baptist Church of God. Me too. Are you reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1879, or reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915? He said, I'm reformed Baptist Church of God, Reformation of 1915. 
And I said, die, you heretic scum. <laughs> We laugh at a joke because there's usually some truth in it. Um, it's an extreme and silly example, but we know that, I'll just speak for us, Christians always have and still do misunderstand each other to the point of mistrust and exclusion and even extermination. And though the followers of Jesus sprang from the Jewish tradition, and we continue to value large parts of that tradition, which we have appropriated as our own, before long we became suspicious and hostile toward those who faithfully lived and preserved that tradition, Jews, to the point of mistrust, exclusion, and extermination. And if you don't already know, then you can probably imagine our response when Islam in the late 6th century. Suspicion, misinformation. When I was young, I was fortunate to grow up uh, in the Chicago area uh, with Jewish people nearby and um, even other Christians of other denominations and, and learn about this. But um, I could see and know their goodness because I knew them. And uh, But for me growing up, Islam was an idea out there somewhere, followed by people in other places, remote and, and not on my radar at all. Later in my trips to the places um, mentioned in the Bible, following the footsteps of Jesus and the other prophets, it brought me in contact with large numbers of Muslims in cities and towns, uh, small villages in the Middle East. And, and I know Islam is a worldwide religion, and actually Indonesia uh, has the most, uh, I think, per capita. But it was my exposure to Islam in the Middle East that really uh, grew my appreciation. There I saw devotion and dedication that keeps inspiring. And there's a million examples. Um, to see a truck driver, a taxi driver stop, get out of their vehicle, and get down, put the rug down, a quick swadu to purify and then say their prayers. Or um, I knew a university student, I was waiting for him, he was giving a senior seminar. When he finished, uh, he got out, and on the tile floor, right in the hallway of the school building, he got down prostrated to pray and give thanks. Um, our driver during Ramadan, our tour driver, um, was fasting for the long day, but he cheerfully brought a tray of drinks to us at lunch. At, um, hospitality uh, trumped uh, his uh, wanting to fast quietly. Um, I have a million others. Uh, the devotion to prayer, a Palestinian car mechanic, uh, his, his uh, sisters and mother all got a pass to come to Jerusalem for one day. He didn't, so he risked his life by climbing over the security wall, just so he could pray for one day at um, the Dome of the Rock. And um, both uh, devotion and hospitality, my barber and his brother, one time during Ramadan, uh, I had about a two o'clock haircut, and they said, you know, we're not going home tonight. We're gonna order in, uh, come back here at sunset and eat with us, and then we're gonna work later. All these things, um, oh, one more. Uh, that same barber let me share his prayer rug uh, while he did his evening prayers, where I had some other Muslim friends who asked me to please leave the room, not be in the room when they pray. But for both, I was impressed by their devotion. Um, with my new Muslim friends, we didn't discuss doctrines or dogmas or history. Um, and only occasionally was I asked why Christians worship as many as seven gods. Um, we actually don't, but I understand that our belief in one god has some confusing footnotes. Um, with them, we were able to thank God together for food, for freedom to pray, for our lives and health, for our families and communities. 
We were agreed that God is God, and we are God's creatures, that the goodness and providence of God was everywhere to be seen, even in suffering. We all knew that we are not God. We are different from God. Remember, I'm thinking of differences. And though God is completely other and different from us, yet in love, God pours out mercy. Love, affection, friendship, service to others, witnessing for justice, all these are what lets us see beyond differences. Do I have two more minutes? Um, our prophet St. Paul said um, in his new understanding of life beyond tribal religion, but with bigger eyes, he said there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in the anointed one, Jesus. My teacher said that that in no way implies that differences should be ignored or dismissed, for although it's true that there is neither Greek nor Jew, we are one human family, we're all in this together, the fact is there are Greeks and Jews and Catholics and Protestants and Sunni and Shia and others. When we look for those things which unite, prayer, hospitality, service to others, spiritual thirst, the casting out of the demons of human suffering, making a place for healing, hope, health, nourishment, connection, flourishing in faith, this assortment collapses the differences, and yet it doesn't permit us to lose sight of the fact that in the world, there are differences. One can even maintain, said my teacher, that there's nothing else except difference. We are different from one another. We are different from God. Viva la difference for devoted believers, Jew, Muslim, Christian, and everyone else. Our differences are a reflection of God's mysterious otherness. God's distance and difference from the creation from us. And yet, our love and care for each other and our standing with each other reflect God's overflowing heart of love and care, God's closeness to creation and to us. Ramadan Mubarak.